Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. The car we're featuring today, a 1934 Rolls-Royce with a Merlin aircraft engine. This has been uh, in the garage. Oh, God, I've had this thing a long time, almost 30 years. It's a fascinating uh, automobile. You know, I've always been fascinated by aero engine cars. And back in the 80s, I read about a man named uh, Paul Jameson who built some fantastic Merlin-powered cars in England. You can Google his name and look it up. Uh, oh, he ran all sorts of demonstration runs around England with these things. He built one with six wheels and all this kind of thing. Well, he told me he had a running engine and chassis with kind of a homemade wooden body on it. Uh, it was on a Rolls a P2 chassis. And uh, I said, okay, I'll buy it. I think, I think I caught him off guard. He was so stunned that I bought this thing. And I flew it over here, and we really had our work cut out for us. It was running a Jaguar gearbox, a Moss box out of an XK120. And the trouble with an engine like this, it makes 1,750 foot-pounds of torque. There's not a gearbox or clutch that could take the power. And it was running a Holley four-barrel carburetor, I got it here, we got it running. I said, let me take it for a ride. I put my foot into it. I hit second gear and didn't even press the gas all the way to the floor. And I heard, Bling! and what's that? And I wasn't moving anymore. Every tooth had <laughs> broken off second gear. I thought, oh. So I found another Jaguar gearbox and I put that in. And of course, hey, same thing happened again. Well, the after that, just Bling! all the teeth. I said, okay, what am I gonna do with this thing? I, I, I didn't want to put an automatic gearbox in it. You know, we have the other Merlin-powered car. Actually, it's a media-powered car, the Bentley, this one here. But I, that had an automatic gearbox. I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep it sort of, well, I just like a manual gearbox. So we brought it into the shop, and this is a restoration that took the better part of 20 years. You know, just so many things came along and other projects. and start it and stop it and try and find different solutions. And we also wanted to design a proper period looking body for this thing. And I think we accomplished that uh, task pretty well. I, it looks period, it looks proportional, it looks correct. Well, let me bring in uh, Jim Hall. Jim is our chief fabricator. Jim, come on in. Jim, I believe, was 17 years old when he started this project. <laughs> and uh, he's now 28 and you can see the toll it's taken on him. This is unbelievable. <laughs> You know, and Jim and Bernard and George and all the guys, a pair, they all did a wonderful job. The first thing we should do is show the engine because that's the heart of this beast. That was the whole idea behind it. Uh, let me show you what we got here. Uh, okay. Here we have a uh, Merlin Spitfire engine built in Glasgow, Scotland, birthplace of my mother. It's a Mark 114. It makes, I guess, without the supercharger, around 1,000 horsepower, maybe a little we're, bit more. I mean, that. we're not going to put it on a dyno, no, so no. yeah, it's... We don't have a dyno that can measure it. That's really the idea behind it. It's a beautiful engine. You know I'm fascinated by these things. You saw the one we had on a test stand. Well, here, show that one. There we go. That's what it looked like when it was in the aircraft. As you can see, it's mounted backwards with the propeller end mounted into the transmission, and the two-stage superchargers are off it. We're running it normally aspirated now. We've got six Weber carburetors on it, and using our 3D printer, Jim and the guys made the intake manifold, and it seems to work pretty well. If you're wondering what this plaque is, it says, in memory of Thomas J. Lane, Jr., Corporal U.S. Army, 5th Corps of Engineers, Special Brigade, died on Normandy Beach, June 6, 1944. His son, uh, Tom, is a, a, a good friend of mine, and he told me the story of his dad. His dad was a young American soldier. He went to England. He met an English girl. He married her. They had a child. Two weeks later, he shipped out to Normandy Beach and died on June 6. And Tom never really knew his dad, and I just thought I would put this on here just as a tribute. You know, we forget uh, we have fun building these hot rods, and we forget the real meaning of these motors and these engines and why they were built. 
and they were built to protect our life and our freedoms and he was just one of the many many people that died that day and uh, you know everyone is important and if I could put every one of their names on here uh, I, I, well I wish I could there's just not enough room well that's why it's there and uh, it's just just to honor him and remind people of what this engine was all about you know it's fun to put them in cars and do all that kind of thing but you realize this was built to fight tyranny and win the war and uh, I know there are a lot of great engines in World War II I know whenever I say this is the greatest T to me it's just the greatest because just of the stories and it's a jewel yeah. I mean it, it's unbelievably complex and when you can actually see inside it it's like how did they do this during wartime so it's a great tribute the amazing thing about this engine is this was built under license by Packard in the United States and the idea was to get American manufacturing efficiency to make these engines. And I read that they had to entirely redo all the drawings because the Rolls-Royce drawings, the, the tolerances were so wide, yeah. they said, we can't have interchangeable parts with those tolerances. We have to, we have to do this right. so we can have every part interchangeable with every other engine. Just yeah. pretty amazing. I mean, it's amazing how many of these they built, but this one, I just like it because it's from Scotland and it's a proper Rolls Royce. You know, what happened with a lot of these motors, uh, the ones that weren't good enough for aircraft, they put into tank duty. They would take them and they would put these rubber top hat uh, valve guide seals in to keep them smoking because if a tank smokes, it's going to give away the position. So they called this the meteor when it was in the tank. But the most powerful version was always reserved for the airplanes. And, and that's what it, this one is. And uh, this name just looks so impressive when you see it on, on the valve cover. And of course, the beautiful stainless steel uh, headers, Paul Jameson made those, I believe. Everything else we pretty much did here. Oh, we built, we built a modern radiator with a shell that looks like a Rolls-Royce shell. Right. So that looks appropriate. Uh, the cooling system, we've, which we've talked about before, we added electric cooling pumps because when you first got it you said boy this thing overheated like uh, nobody's business yeah it really did overheat and uh, we're going to put this up in the lift in just a few minutes and show you how complex it is underneath all the work that went into this because everybody tends to take these engines put them in some sort of frame the sophistication of the engine is sort of lost and everything they just sort of go down, blow out rear ends and, and you know, everything else. Uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to make this a proper manual gearbox, but one that could take this power. And we found this, what is it, New Venture? It's a New Venture yeah. NV5600. Your good friend, Gail Banks, gave right. it to you. <laughs> Gail is uh, you know, one of the leading guys in turbocharging and engineering and just uh, amazing. And the fact that you can actually get the power to the ground now, that's what's unbelievable. These wheels we rebuilt with much heavier duty spokes because, uh, well, tires are cheap clutches. I didn't want to put big modern, this is not a dragster, you know, it's not something. Uh, I wanted it to, to look period correct, but I wanted it to be strong and safe because with 1,700 foot pounds of torque, you could, I mean, <laughs> these would look like toothpicks with the original wire spokes. When you put your foot in this thing, it <laughs> pulls so strong. You always feel like you're taxing, you know, you just, we've got 60 gallons of gasoline. We've got two 30 gallon tanks in this thing. Again, gas mileage, not the high point of the automobile, <laughs> but it's, it's not terrible. No, it's and, not, it's not and you get to see your friends at the gas station. Yeah, right? and you know, when you put it in sixth gear, you just take your foot off the gas and it's idling at 700 RPM and you're doing close to 80. <laughs> So it's, it's, oh, that's not too bad. It's got disc brakes uh, all the way around. The uh, body rear axle that we built, which is a Dana 60 rear axle. Right. So we had to do lots of custom things in order to get that functioning with all the rest of the Rolls-Royce stuff. We do not have a Rolls-Royce emblem on it because although it is Rolls-Royce, they tend to get a little uh, <laughs> touchy about claiming, you know, hey, it's not really a Rolls. We well, built. we did leave just the little RR symbol on the, the hubcaps. Yeah, we left on the hubcaps and we left on the valve covers. Yeah. We didn't put the flying lady on there because back in the 60s, uh, my friend John Dodd, he had, 
He built a car called the Beast. Uh, Jameson built it, and I think uh, John worked for a transmission company, uh, European, I think. And anyway, he would take this thing, go tearing through the countryside in England, and he had the big Rolls Royce lady on the front, and they sued him, and they went to court, and oh, he, he rode to court and a horse. I mean, just a crazy, crazy story. <laughs> so I don't, I, 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 I don't, I don't want to go there. But I, I think Rolls Royce would be proud of the workmanship. I mean, it's, it's all, it's a Rolls Royce chassis. It's a Rolls Royce motor, uh, Rolls Royce hubs, uh, dashboard, uh, many other things. So it's a Rolls Royce in spirit, put it that way. And, and, and whenever you drive this thing, you just feel like you're taxing, like you're on a runway all the time. And it does sort of uh, uh, just remind you of those brave men and women that gave their lives uh, protecting our, our life and, and, and building these motors. Let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, as this was an original piece that came with the car. Everything from here back we fabricated. I'm especially proud of the rear section of this car. I thought the guys did a great job. It really looks like a factory body, at least to me. You know, the, it's all proportional. It's just a big, <laughs> giant roadster. <laughs> and a lot of aluminum. And a lot of <laughs> aluminum. Uh, this is reminiscent of the Bugatti uh, Atlantique, which has the rear, has a spare tire under there. Have you got the tool? Let's yeah, open this up and show people what's it. I don't believe there's anything in here right now, but we've got tool chests inside the car to carry tools. And this opens up. See, we have uh, oh, some friction modifier. That's about it. But uh, yeah, that's what. <laughs> Spare tire would go in there. You don't really carry a spare in this. I know this, well, what do you think this thing weighs? Take a guess. A lot of people say 7,000, 8,000 pounds. No, it's 4,800 pounds, which is uh, not bad at all. Most of that is the engine, which is a good 1,700, 1,800 pounds. And then you're carrying about 60 gallons of fuel at what six pounds a gallon yeah so 360 pounds of fuel yeah. we also have our oil tank so there's another nine gallons of oil is it only nine it's only nine yeah i guess that's right now 4800 is really not bad considering what it is i mean a hellcat's probably 43 4400 maybe 4500 oh, yeah modern cars yeah modern cars. of course they're a little safer than this but. modern cars are safer than this that <laughs> is correct but the idea behind this was to build a Merlin you could actually drive in LA traffic. Because a lot of guys build these aero engine cars and they just, you know, they'll go down a drag strip or they'll run for a, uh, a few miles and then they overheat, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, they don't use them as a day-to-day -day car. Not that they use this every day, but the idea is it's just fun to be able to drive it to car shows. I never wanted to, I don't like to trailer a car to a car show. It's a car, it should be able to get to a car show under its own power. You've got 400 miles or something on it? No, no, we've got, a, uh, what do you got? What's it say? Almost a thousand. A thousand miles on it. We've got a thousand miles on it. Well, and you were worried because it overheated so much I when you drove worried. it before. It's like, Jim, is this going to work? Yeah. And it's like, well, I think it's going to work, but I got plans in case it doesn't. Yeah. We haven't had to do it. No, it's work, well, and we're running our Evans cool on this, the non water based cooler, because there's a lot of aluminum in these motors. Oh. This is my favorite thing. This is a hand magneto. These are very rare. In fact, what this does is you have these magnetos. So the starter motor can only turn it so fast. And you're turning well, 27 liters in nine gallons of 50 weight oil. So it's not going to spin real fast. So what well, you, the magneto likes to be turned fast. Right, it makes right. better spark the faster it goes. So this is called a shower of sparks. What this does is as you're hitting the start button, you spin this like this, and it just throws sparks to every cylinder, hoping one will catch. And then, boom, when one catches, then the whole thing starts, and, 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 and you're off to the races. But it's just one of those sort of uh, late, uh, it's after World War I, certainly, but not much after, because all the references I find seem to be mostly, yeah, World War I. Mostly World War I, but it, it's just one of those romantic things that makes it different from. Uh, from uh, other cars and actually makes it hard to steal <laughs> if you don't know what it is. <laughs> I think we're ready to start it up and take it next door, put it up on the lift, 
and just show you how much uh, engineering the guys did on this thing to get. Just did a beautiful job. It's it's really a wonderful thing to drive. It, it's the first one of these aero engine specials I've seen that's really just finished. And uh, well, you're never really finished. You're always doing something with them, but roadworthy, say. I can take this in LA traffic and it's not a problem. Come on, I'll show you what we're talking about. Okay, first we'll explain all the gauges and what they do, and then we'll go through the firing up process, which is uh, exactly like flying an airplane almost. We have our clock over here, our main power headlights uh, here, mag one and two. We have our starting magneto, which is this one here, which I explained uh, a little earlier. We have two tanks, 30 gallons on each side, that's left and right. Oil primer, very important. Tachometer, water temperature, oil temperature, speedometer. Now the first thing you need to do with this thing is hit the oil primer. That shoots oil throughout the whole engine. The most critical part of any engine like this is startup, because when you're starting it initially, the oil's not flowing. So what this does is essentially, uh, for lack of a better word, gets the oil pump flowing, although it's not the actual oil pump, it's another pump. It shoots oil through everything, so everything is well lubricated the minute it starts. Uh, you want to have about 100 pounds of oil pressure before you actually start. So main power okay here we go oil pressure 20 pounds 30 pounds 40 pounds 45 50 pounds okay give you're, that about you're good yeah that's 50 pounds of pressure okay we now have fuel uh starting mag on left mag right mag uh, we in neutral? Yeah. Okay, we've got it up on our sterile Coney lift here, giving you an idea of what's happening underneath. It looks pretty clean, because it's got just about a thousand miles on it. If you wonder what this is, uh, this is the transmission. This is a skid plate we put on the, uh, probably every couple of thousand miles we replace these runners here because this thing sits so low and it's so long that you, you scrape. So rather than do scrape the transmission, we just, uh, see this, this whole thing comes off. It's like a, well, it's a skid plate or a, 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 well, a roll bar for under the car. We're kind of forced into it because this power takeoff right. unit is what we use to run our, our alternator right. for a 24 volt uh, electrical system. This car runs on 24 volts and 12. So the engine and the starter is 24 volts, uh, but all the accessories are 12 volts. So we have two batteries back there and we mm -hmm. run it as a 24 volt system and then we can pair off and make it 12 volts. But let's go back up here to our radiator. Okay, you got your water line. We have electric water pumps here, which help circulate uh, well, it's not water, it's uh, Evans coolant. It's coolant in this thing. Well, and I, our thinking was, if you're sitting at a stoplight, this great big aircraft water pump is just barely turning over. Right, it's not really right. pumping water. So by having the electric pumps on it, even if you're at a stoplight, it's getting good flow through the radiator and through the engine. And don't forget, this thing is meant to run at three to 4,000 RPM when it's in the plane. Riding around town, you're turn it to 700, 800 RPM, you know. So uh, it's not working as hard as it should. So these, these electric pumps augment that very nicely. Uh, these are all oil lines. You can see them going here, the temperature switch there. Uh, we did the power takeoff already. You notice we have oxygen sensors here. Uh, we have those just to get the, to help set the carburetors. Get That's another one of those things Gail Banks is helping yeah. us with to to data log what's exactly going on because right. trying to jet uh, six carburetors, 12 throats for a 27 liter engine, yes. Right, and plus I don't think, I don't think there are any Merlins running on Weber carburetors. I just like Webers because they look sexy and, <laughs> and it looks good under there. You got to mix, it looks kind of cool. I mean, what it had originally, here I'll show you this, one. just a big Holly four barrel carburetor, just, just dumping gas down there and it just, <laughs> kind of went everywhere and the cylinders were not very well, uh, the front was getting more than the rear, I, you know, so now at least I think it's we, we're getting all the cylinders being fed equally. Uh, what are we, uh, clutch problems, what do we have here? Get, well, up in the bell housing, so like you said, it's a big heavy duty truck transmission. Right. 
and it's a dual plate clutch. So the clutch can take the torque. Uh, it's a standard clutch. It's an off-the-shelf item. It's not one of those racing clutches right. that we've sometimes dealt with. I mean, it was stunning. I, I put that Jag Moss box in there, and not even, not like I'm nailing it off the line. I just, first gear, shift to the second. All right, let's give it a little bit of throw. It was just, bring all the, every, the gearbox is just all broken teeth. It's amazing how powerful this motor is. And, you know, so many guys that do this aero stuff, they put the big automatic transmissions with the torque converters, but they just seem sluggish, and it's not as exciting. And so, but you like that manual yeah, transmission. I like it having feels that, like it should be. It feels like a proper car. They didn't even have automatics when this was. Well, they did, right. actually. The Hydromatic came out in 38. <laughs> I love but. that the six-speed is an overdrive. So this thing, that's where you get that 600 RPM while yeah. flying down the freeway. And you can literally pull away in sixth if you wanted to. You can pull <laughs> away in any gear in this thing. You know, that's what makes it interesting. But it's just more precise, you know. The other uh, Merlin-powered uh, car has an automatic box. It just, it, it's just all over the place. Whereas this is, uh, it's, it's, it's just more exciting and more fun. Okay, let's go to our dry shaft. Obviously, we had to... Make that's a custom-made piece. Yeah, that's a custom-made piece. Yeah, uh, and, and this this Dana 60 axle. Yeah, I mean uh, it's not that big, and it takes uh, it takes this power. It's impressive. It's an impressive piece there because you can just put all kinds of power to it. You see, we have the two battery boxes. There's your your Dynamat up there. These are all your. Look at the nice job Jim did here with all these uh, oil lines. Everything's nicely hung. Nothing's hanging down. There's no weeping, there's nothing leaking here. I mean, it's a real engineering feat. The guys did just a great job, all the electronics up here. It's just such a fascinating car to drive, you know. I've, I was never a pilot, obviously, so the chance to be able to sort of fly a Merlin engine on the street. Uh, you, run, you know, the, it carries its weight up high. These cams are up here. So when you come to corners, it's, you know, it's a bit like Dolly Parton. It, it carries its weight up high. You know, so you, you have to sort of uh, be careful with all of it. So the fact that this thing is running, it's, it's, it, and you when can you, drive it, it's just amazing. You talk about feeling like you're taxiing, yeah. but we have a friend that has a P-51 that sometimes taxis out here. Right, right, yeah. And it's like, it's the exact same sound. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> the, uh, the P-51s, a lot of times, uh, the guys will bring their, we're right on the airstrip of Burbank Airport. And uh, you'll hear those planes and think, is that Jay coming in? No, no, that's the Merlin. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Tom Cruise has got one of the Merlins, with one of the Spitfires with this in it. Uh, he says a Mustang, a P-51 Mustang. But basically, that's the Packard built version of the same motor. Let's see, anything else under here we have? Oh, this is our... Um, our um, well, that's the uh, Vanner box. Yeah, so yeah. when you have a 24-volt system, you have to be able to charge both 12-volt right. batteries equally, and that's what the Vanner system does. Yeah. And uh, they've, been, they've been very helpful to us. And that really noisy priming pump, that's yeah. what this is up right. here. Um, that's a 24-volt thing, so when, when I built the electrical system for this car, you got to take all that into account. You got some motors that are 24 volt, relays that are 24 volt. You've got other stuff that's 12 volt. Right. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's pretty amazing. But I think we're about ready to go for a ride and give you an idea what this thing is like. Jim, thanks a lot. <laughs> all right. This is the perfect weather for this car. About 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. The torque is unbelievable. You got such a throttle. It's like the hand. God, it just pushes you. It's just such a torque monster. Hilarious. And you can pull away in any gear. It doesn't matter. I just love the fact you really have to touch the gas and you get that tremendous surge. It's extremely cold-blooded. takes a long time to warm this, this much engine up. you got 1,700 pounds of motor to warm up as well as nine gallons of oil. Probably got to go a good 40 or 50 Mustang. We wanted to utilize our American manufacturing techniques. You know, we are able to build a fighter plane an hour. And there was nobody else in the world could match us in terms of manufacturing capabilities and speed. And so when they decided to use an 
American version of the Merlin engine. Part of the deal was Merlin uh, wanted us to build it using Whitworth or British Standard threads. And they had to redo every blueprint for every part of the Merlin engine. They had to simplify the manufacturing process because the Merlin was so complex, it just took too long to assemble. We needed to be able to assemble them like the way we assembled V8 engines. So it was an amazing undertaking for both the English and the Americans working as a team to translate those brute blueprints into American threads. You know, it's not like now where everybody kind of knows a little bit about metric and everything. Back then, we didn't know anything about metric or British standard. We just had American half inch, quarter inch, you know, like that. So it was just an amazing, uh, amazing undertaking that they were able to pull it off. In fact, if you uh, go to Jay Leno's garage, Merlin engine, you'll see a Packard built version. I have one in my shop, and you'll see us fire it up with the propeller on the stand. It's an impressive sight. My friend Richard Pack has got a real Merlin engine uh, aircraft utilizing this motor. And uh, I got a chance to fly in that plane, and boy, it was really something. And you realize how brave the guys were that flew these things back in the day. I mean, believe me, driving around that street is exciting, but not nearly as exciting as piloting one of those. Pretty amazing aircraft. I drop it in sixth gear, and I'm, well, I'm turning about four or 500 RPM. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I don't think this engine ever ran this slow in its life. Probably can use a power boost brake, a uh, power booster, a brake booster rather, for the brakes. That's the next thing, we'll put a brake booster in. It takes an awful lot of pressure to stop this thing. But as you can see, the guys did a great job. What a temperature, 108, about 180 degrees. Oil starting to get warm, <laughs> about 125 degrees now. Here are some pictures of the mill. Let me show you what. Uh, what this undertaking was. You know, you never really finish building a car like this. There's always some improvement you can do. That's why I always laugh when I watch these car shows where, ah, oh, people build a special in, you know, a couple of weeks, boom, it's out the door now. This is uh, 25 years. Starting to get some heat in it now. Here we go. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. You know, we have a lot of fun with these things, but you never want to forget the main purpose of why they were built. You know, they were built to win a war, and this was a weapon and a very effective one. And it hadn't been for the men and women engineers and the guy who flew these things, we wouldn't be able to join him today. So that's what we like to do. You know, if you feel like making a donation to a veterans group, please do it. You know, I, I think it'd be a nice gesture. And by keeping this in this car, I'd like to think this engine will keep running for long after we're gone so people can get a chance to see and feel and hear what, what, uh, what it was like. So, okay, thanks you guys. Hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you next week.